Shipping's gone through a sort of enormous change over the last 20 years. Um, a fair bit of that change has been driven by the customer. Um, and if you think about China as the customer for the shipping industry, has driven an enormous amount of change with its growth over the, over the period. Um, but also vetting has also driven some of that behaviour. Uh, firstly, the oil companies, um, in response to oil major, you know, major oil spills and the, and the threat and, the, and in fact the consumer boycott of their bowsers made them start and look at what they were doing in the, in the vetting space and what happened with shipping. Um, uh, but the oil business has also changed dramatically over the 20 years. Uh, it used to be, you know, the oil majors had most of it, but now we see the largest charter of VLCCs is Unipec, a Chinese chartering arm. So we've seen that, but we've also seen the fragmentation of the industry, the rise of the, ch of the traders, oil traders, state-owned companies, um, and the oil majors actually selling out of what, what you might consider non-core assets. And so it's a boom, a boom for us in our vetting business because um, as those oil majors left those facilities, they were looking for some sort of vetting services and we were able to, to uh, provide that service. So, where did we come from? Um, right your bones at seeds back to further than 20 years, about 1992 when the Ships and Shame Inquiry launched uh, and, and changed the sort of maritime regulatory space in Australia in particular. But this was felt by ship owners around the world, and in fact, is still felt by ship owners around the world. I still meet a lot of owners who are, will, will not go to Australia, but also very nervous about going to Australia because of AMSA's perceived uh, toughness around ships. Right? Uh, between 1988 and 91, about 1,000 seafarers perished in large bulk carriers leaving Australian waters. Um, and as a result of sub, both substandard practices on the ship and on the terminals themselves, um, and this was an unacceptable outcome from that. Um, the inquiry uh, promoted, if you like, an effort on shippers to take more interest in, their, uh, in, their, in the ships that were arriving at the ports. Most of the cargo was being shipped FOB, and so therefore they had little control over the vessels that were coming to the terminals. Um, what I like to call the Swiss cheese model, and if you, for, for vetting, um, how does that play into place? And so when, when, when we started and our model, we looked at all of the safety regimes that were in place, um, and if they were all working properly, probably wouldn't need a vetting organisation. And I've always said my job was actually to do myself out of a job, because if we all obeyed the law, then you wouldn't even need policemen. So, so... But if you think about the defences, we've heard two speakers this morning talking about the systems that they have in place for managing safety, so the owner. Then we've got class and flag, we've got global port state control, and then, in, in a sense, ship vetting, because the ship vetting actually stops the vessel being an arrived vessel before it arrives in someone's ports. The local port state control, it's already an arrived vessel, so if it's going to have an incident, it can still have that incident in your terminal, in your port, in your, in your maritime area. And so ships, ship vetting, if you like, is trying to exclude those all out from it before it actually arrives as, a, as an arrived vessel. Um, uh, the SIA program, from where did we go from petroleum to dry bulk vetting? The SIA program was launched in 1993 um, to address the concerns around the substandard tankers, um, and, it's, and it's done over uh, uh, 180,000 inspection reports from there. Um, uh, mainly used by the oil majors, but more and more people now are using that. Rightship was established in 2001 um, by BHP and, and Rio Tinto. And like, uh, like uh, as parents with second children or a second child, um, you learn from the mistakes. And we looked at the SIA system and said, well, what's good and what's not so good when we started to develop up our own, our, our own if you like, vetting platform. Um, one of the things that we were trying to establish is because that FOB sales were so high, how do you vet a vessel that you've never seen before that, if you like, uh, below the horizon, and, and we needed a tool to be able to do that. Um, but our thinking was not to add more layers of inspections that are already in place, but rather measure and rate the performance of others um, in, involved in the safety chain. 
Um, and so that included class and flag, the owner, the manager, and even down to the shipyards. And so I think you know, we were unique in that space that we started to create this uh, league table of all of those different organisations. And, uh, and, and it had an effect. Nobody likes to be coming last. Um, and organisations started to wonder why, why they weren't at the top of the table when they considered them to be best in, best in practice around the place. We also introduced a star rating or risk rating um, and some would call that a classification. Um, and, and, and it's what class societies originally used to do uh, but now they certify and they moved away from classifications. Um, and, and in fact, it was what the customer was after. Um, he wasn't asked a certification, he wanted a classification of that vessel, whether it be one star, five star, whether it be safe for this or safe for that. Um, you don't get that from class societies. Um, uh, along with that star rating, we believe that we should recognise other organisations who shared a sort of a common vision around improving safety performance. And we have formed alliances with, with people like the Green Award, Intercargo, and many others to see if we could create a momentum, a momentum around, around recognising and rewarding better, better performers. Um, uh, that was to get that recognition um, and we hoped that we would ha have a situation where we created a two-tier market that would benefit um, those who, who put their investment into their vessels. Um, unfortunately, I don't think that ever really occurred. The market is what it is and it became more of a compliance uh, that got you in the door. Right? Um, but I've got no doubt in my mind that one of the most important side effects of the star rating was the down rating component of the star rating. Um, something not very popular, but it did, it did create a momentum that people needed to then start and close things out. And even after 20 years of the ISM code, we still had situations where people were not doing any preventive and corrective actions around non-compliance. And, and so when we started to ramp that up, and in a sense using a stick to say, if you don't give us that, then your star rating will stay the same, um, then that's when we actually started to see some actions in that. Uh, but I remember, you know, the star rating had its also had its benefits. Uh, on, on many occasion, normally at the stand at Posidonia with David, where owners would be very surprised to find that we'd vetted, carried out multiple vetting clearances on their vessels, and yet we'd never had to seek any information from them. And again, that was part of the model that says, if you're operating at that sort of level, if you're compliant with all those things, why should we put a layer of activity across you? And so those things used to happen behind the scenes. Um, you can see our growth over the years. What we did is provide that, that opportunity for the smaller shipper and charter, charterer to engage in vetting or some sort of due diligence on the, on the system um, that they could never support or build themselves. So we gave them access to a platform that was, uh, was, was beyond their means in some ways. But it was not only the charterers who became interested uh, in rightship, it wasn't long before the banks p &I Club, insurance, flag states, all wanted to understand how the use of a systematic risk tool like Rightship could work for them. Um, uh, other speakers talked about what was coming along and certainly um, we looked at particularly around the emissions area. We introduced our greenhouse gas emissions rating in 2009 um, and you can see its growth over that period. Um, we have a free, to free platform out there, shippingefficiency.org, because we wanted to create the discussion around the, around the activity. We wanted to engage with organisations to do that. Now we have some 85 of our customers who not only use a, a sort of a safety part of their vessel selection, but also introducing the emissions component into that. And that represents about 2.4 billion tonne a year. Um, and again, on the positive side, it's being used for providing incentives for vessels. So owners who are investing in, uh, in efficiency are getting rewarded in ports around the world um, and reduced port fees by having that efficiency. So where do we go to from here? Modern day vetting, um, it's, a, it's, it's more of a service um, and certainly there's, you know, we, we've, we've got 
when we started uh, 16 years ago. Probably not a lot of competition. There's lots of more competition in the market now. Uh, um, and, and it tells us that the system has changed. Um, used to be the you know, just the pure domain of the oil majors, and now it's right across the industry, and we, we're vetting all sorts of vessels, project cargoes, container vessels. Um, and, and, our, and the use of that systematic tool by banks and others who are looking at all sorts of things. Um, we've, the, the sort of platform, scalable, tailorable to individual organisations' needs, um, and it's not just about vetting for safety, um, but the devil in the detail. And, you know, it's interesting as I sort of am starting to phase out of rightship in a sense. Um, you saw the broken ship there before and that's what we were originally brought in to do. Um, now, you know, vessels are being vetted and screened and incidents being recorded on vessels that arrive in port with mud on their anchors. And you think, well, mud on their anchors, they didn't wash it down properly. That's a, that's a, a health and safety issue. In your, if you're in a lines boat and that anchor is 20 metres above you and four kilos of solid mud falls on your head, it's probably going to hurt fairly badly. And so, so we're seeing that change in, in expectation around all of those different aspects as as the, as the interaction between the ship gets even greater. And so vetting in a very different place these days. And of course, right ship, we, we went down a predictive analytics path, uh, much more complex. Um, I love Sean's piece about how do you make it simple. Boy, Sean, I'd love you to make predictive analytics simple. If you can get that word working for me, I'd be very happy. Um, but, but it's also... Um, going to introduce a new aspect of it is, is this bitspoke piece of work where, where um, people will be looking for different predictive analytics parts of that and we're certainly doing some of that around insurance and claims data and using it to do that. What does it look like? What else is going to happen? There's no doubt that, that all of our lives are going to be impacted by machine learning. Um, that we're starting to see that occurring in lots of different places um, and so uh, it, it, you know, people talk about the, the, the impact of machine learnings taking over white collar jobs all over the world as these machines get smarter and smarter. Um, that's, that's our vetting algorithm, if you like, sitting in front of you there. Um, all the ships in are about 61,000 vessels and they all come down those various different nodes and it's very much machine learning that's doing that sort of aspect of it. Um, very good, but, but how's it working? If you look... If you look at uh, one minute, correct. Uh, how do we know the pr pr machine learning is, is, is a better outcome for us? If you look at, at, at this table there, the star ratings there, one to five star, the vessel counts, the amount of casualties that come in there, and then the casualty rate. And you can see there that in a predictive model, that, that a one star vessel is 19 times more likely to have an incident than a five star vessel. And so human couldn't have had done that sort of work. They would, by the time they'd worked it out, the next cycle would have been through. And so machine learning is doing that sort of uh, aspect of it and giving us that predictability. What's next? Um, uh, and so what's the next piece that's going to come through? Um, Seafarers Welfare and MLC, a couple of other speakers spoke, spoke on that, that, uh, that component of it. There's no doubt that 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 organisations uh, are getting more and more interested in welfare and a fairness, if you like, around seafarers. And so we see this as coming in um, in it to a greater and greater sense with our customers being involved in it. Industry platforms are starting to see those popping up all over the place. So for owners and charterers, that these industry platforms that we, may take out brokers, they may take out a whole lot of other place, but also what happens in a vetting cycle where, where it's, an, it's a reverse auction or it's a platform where those vessels are being matched with cargoes. And so how does vetting fit into that sort of cycle where it's going to be more online? Um, Transparency and access to data, um, you know, everybody talks about it, but it's coming, you know, more and more access will be available to it. And as I said, machine learning tools, IBM Watson. Um, if you haven't seen it, go and have a look, go and Google IBM Watson, and there's more and more pieces coming out there um, that is going to make those decisions around what we would have traditionally had as maritime players. Uh, traditionally, they would have been maritime experienced people doing that. 
um, machines will start and take that over. If you think about it, talking about autonomous vessels, if machines can run the ships, surely they can also vet the ships at the same time. Okay, thank you very much.